in. Okay, so this week's parsha is Parsha's Mishpatim, begins on page 417. Um, and these are the ordinances that he shall place before them, and it, be, it goes into the laws of the Jewish bondsmen. So to begin the commentary's comment about the um, that we had just left off with the Asaras uh, Adibris, the Ten Commandments, and um, now we go straight into, and these are the ordinances. When it says, and these, we're kind of, it's always a, a continuation of what we had said previously. So the Ramban says that, first of all, our sages say, that it's to make a statement that just like the Ten Commandments were commanded by Sinai, so too these ordinances were also commanded at Mount Sinai. So it's not to think that there's two kinds of mitzvahs. There's the mitzvahs that are part of, part of the Torah, that are the good deeds, as we like to say. This is what our, involves our religious observance. And then there are these laws that are necessary for society to function. That in order for it to have a civil society, you need to have some kind of social contract of how um, how you're interacting with each other and what responsibilities you have towards each other. And so one could say, and every country has, or every really society has some kind of legal system for dealing with property and dealing with interpersonal relations. Um, but And that's what the Torah is making a strong statement. And these are the ordinances saying that just like the Ten Commandments were given to us, we heard Hashem speak at Mount Sinai. So these ordinances are also given to Moshe at Mount Sinai. And there are um, and there are mitzvahs, just like every other mitzvah in the Torah. And to keep them is part of our religious observance. And um, the Ramban says also that after the Ten Commandments... So we start actually um, going back, I think, on page 413. Um, where are we? Um, page 413, verse 19. This is right after the Ten Commandments. It says, Hashem said to Moshe, So shall you say to the children of Israel, You have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make images of what is with me, gods of silver and, and, gods, and gods of gold, you shall not make for yourself. Then immediately after the Ten Commandments, there's some elaboration of them. The first of all, you have seen that, that I've spoken to you from heavens. That's equivalent to I am Hashem, your God. And then there is you shall not make images of what was made, gods of silver and gold. That's um, the second commandment of you shall not have among yourself. And it continues with many of and there's an elaboration of the Ten Commandments. And these are the ordinances is an elaboration of the Tenth Commandment, which is thou shall not covet what belongs to others. That I know. And this, and how, and in order for to understand that mitzvah not to covet, you have to understand what does belong to others, and you have to understand personal property and the laws governing that. And that's what this parsha begins with, and it continues with many other. Um, it continues with other mitzvahs as well. It has the mitzvah of Shabbos and um, and some and some of the and the laws of witnesses, perhaps, and um, others of the Ten Commandments as well. But the first of the ordinances, as we said, was in verse 2, if you shall buy a Jewish bondsman, he shall work for six years, the seventh he shall go free for no charge, and the various laws of a Jewish bondsman, a Jewish slave, servant. So why is that the first of the laws? You would think that there would be a more basic um, law, don't steal, and if you steal, this is what you have to do. Other laws that are mentioned in this parsha, like um, if someone damages someone else, or if their property damages someone else, if they take on responsibility, custodial responsibility for someone else's property, what what um, liability do they, do they have? Some more basic things. Why do we go straight to the slave, the Jewish bondsman? And I'm listening. Yeah. Well, it's, it says here that Yes, that that's one aspect is that we have to remember that we were all slaves and Hashem took us out of Egypt. And that's also a callback to the first of the Ten Commandments, which was, I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of Egypt. And as and the, the, so this is kind of a callback to that first command, first of the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. But also involved in the slavery, there's a hint to Shabbos as well. And that is that 
he shall work for six years in the seventh year he shall go free for no charge so just like we're commanded that, that we work for six days in the seventh day it's the shabbos we do no work hashem created the world in six days and rested on the seventh and the ramban also adds that um, when it comes to the history and destiny of the world that there will be six millennia uh, that it says that uh, that a uh, thousand years to Hashem are like one day for us, that the six millennia of a world of work, and then there will be rest in the seventh millennia. And these are all hinted in this um, in this Jewish bondsman that he works for six days and six years. I'm sorry, in the seventh year he goes free. Okay, and then the, elsewhere it says that we have to give him severance. But what's this whole idea of the Jewish bondsman? So the commentaries say that the common way a person could sell himself, but it was the, the way that it would usually happen is that if a person stole from someone else and now and then they consumed what they stole, they don't have the ability to pay back. So they would be um, the court would sell them on an open market. Who wants to take this person as a as a butler, as a house servant? And that's how he would make restitution. And that's how he would make restitution to the people that he stole from. And I, I just find this very interesting. I was recently reading an article from, it was absolutely crazy people, but who believe in completely abolishing prisons. Okay, that's their belief. So, um, but part of what they're saying is that prisons don't really do anything for the, it doesn't help make amends to the people that were that were hurt. It doesn't help make the people that were hurt whole. It might satisfy their feeling of revenge, but um, you're putting people away, just basically taking their life away, years and years and years of their life, which really did, never existed. It used to be that we'd have corporal punishment. <laughs> so it was a momentary, maybe even crippling. They were, you know, someone stole in the other countries. This isn't Jewish law. They would actually chop off their hand. And then they'd be then they'd go free. So they might be crippled for life, but they have their life. And uh, and or sometimes if they stole, they would be hang they would be hanged, and then their life is over. But there wasn't this institution of like having this just like be in prison and be like kind of like in between, alive, not well, alive. I think when first colonists came over, the stock. Right, exactly, but it wasn't a there forever. There was maybe a day, two days. I right, don't know. And, right. It was cor them, so. exactly. It was corporal punishment. It was a short term. It was like it, it's it's just an interesting thing to think about that it was just like the punishment was momentary. It might have a lifelong ramifications, like we said, like getting a hand chopped off or being extremely uncomfortable in the stocks. You know, like have being bent over and being completely. Um, you know, not able to move in uncomfortable positions, I'm sure it could be crippling. But um, but when that was done, it was done. And um, but this, but and and in the Torah also, there weren't. We don't find a punishment of of um, jet prison in the Torah. There is um, someone who kills unintentionally will go into exile, but they're just moving to a city. They can't leave that city, but they're living in the city free. And um, but this is the case where we give them an opportunity to do make restitution and to make the people that they damage hold that we have to pay if they can't pay. So they pay with their bodies, but freedom is there. It's a, like a seven year, almost like a seven year, six year sentence. But w during that sentence, they're making restitution for what they did and making the people they stole from whole by um, working towards paying them back. I just found that very interesting. Okay, and just for Alan, on page 419, that we said in the seventh year they go free, and it says in verse 5, but if the bondsman shall say, I love my master, my wife, my children, I shall not go free, that his master shall bring him to the court, shall bring him to the door, to the doorpost, and his master shall bore, B-O-R-E, through his ear with the awl, and he shall serve him forever. No. So um, what's this idea of boring through his ear with the all? So the the um, our sages say that it's a uh, it's a hint to him that the ear that heard at Mount Sinai that you are my servants, and instead of wanting to serve Hashem, he wants to 
serve his master, like be a servant of a servant instead of serving Hashem. And he doesn't have the freedom to find his own path in the service of Hashem in this way. And it's something you can imagine. It says that I love my wife, my children, but also, and that was in a case where he would be given to marry a non-Jewish slave, in which case the children would remain with the master. But um, it's also a case that some people can get comfortable, people get comfortable in jail and can function outside of jail. It's that, and people could get comfortable in the army, even, and not be comfortable out of the army, that people could um, enjoy structure and not having to make decisions. Well, I don't know about the army back then, but it, in the current army, you can't stay forever. Yes, they'll run you out. I mean, but at some point, you, you have to retire. Right, at some point, you have to retire. Oh. What is, but it, I, I can amend that people retire and then they don't know what to do with themselves. Right, there are plenty of and a part of that is that they're um, when someone's in, they're free from making decisions for themselves, big decisions for themselves, for the most part. Those are made for them. Mm -hmm. They're told where you go, where you sleep, what you eat, um, go there, go there, shoot there. And um, making decisions is one of the hardest things in life. And I heard a story, a story from my Rosh Hashiva, Chaim Bressler, about somebody that was hired, um, Herbie could have related, I guess, someone who was hired by a farmer to grade potatoes. That, you know, like you have grade A, grade B, grade uh, C, and it's something we also I do with Rabbi Slatis before Sukkot. We grade the lulavim. That like this is a an excellent lulav. This is a um, good lulav. This is a passable lulav, and this is a chinuch lulav. This one we'll give to the kids. Right. And um, we'll sit there and we have discussions over some of them about like, well, where does this one go? You're like, this has, is this enough to actually move it down, pump it down a level? And so anyway, this guy was um, working all day, you know, like, this is a good one. That's not bad. That one, you know, that one's rot rotting. And at the end of the day, he went to the farmer and said, I can't do this. He quit. Farmer said, one day and it's already too much for you? He said, all day long is decisions, decisions, decisions. <laughs> <laughs> and and yeah, I'm sure now that now it's automated. Take the decisions away from people. They don't trust people <laughs> anymore. But and but decisions are really hard. And for some people, they'd rather be in jail where they have a clean bed and they have their and they're told where to be at all times instead of deciding after having to make decisions. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And um, this is this this that's what the slave wants to be. They don't want to be a servant of Hashem where um, we have challenges throughout life. We have to make moral choices. And sometimes the moral choices are very hard to make because we really might, um, you know, our bodies might want something different than what the mitzvah is, what Hashem wants from us. And um, he wants to just stay under his master where the master tells him, you do this, you go this, you do this. He doesn't have those choices. So they bore through his ear to say that the ear that heard at Mount Sinai, you're my servant, and he doesn't want that. He doesn't want to make those decisions. And as a servant of Hashem, he wants someone to tell him what to do. Well, here's a good, yeah. interesting question. I'm not being facetious. Yeah. Go back to the gal instead of Yeah. Okay, so you've got your servant. Yeah. For the your next door neighbor's got one for his ear. How do you know who's who? I mean, you do. I guess you know the person. The other one, they still have a hole in there unless, like, we some kind of token in there. No, I think you know the person. They're, they're still whole people with, you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, but the commentary, I think the Klayakar asked, so what is it about that door, though? It says you bore his ear against the door. Why is it against the door? What's the significance of the door that's involved in there, in the doorpost? Is that because that was something sturdy that you could actually pull? Over? I don't know. You would think you could use a wall. You could use a counter. I don't know. I don't know what they had, a table. So, uh, he, so how is the servant being against the door? Yeah. And how is the uh, master supposed to get to the ear? The ear is against the door. I assume that they do it from the back. So they'd go through here or through here. I don't know which part of the ear it was. I, I never figured yeah. this out. Yes, yeah, so they would go through the back of the ear. So like oh. through here, you'd have it against it. The ear lobe? I don't think it's the ear lobe. That's an assumption that people make. I think it's the top of the ear. I've, but, I, I've always thought. Yeah. Okay, but even if it's the ear lobe, it would be, it would go through the back as it's against the wall. 
But um, just so the, I think the Kleyakra says about the door is that he so he compares it to um, like say if someone's in prison, they unlock the door, and there's there's a there's a marshal they give there's a parable they give where um, where there's a group in prison and um, they break out, they uh, you know they they manage to get the door open and everyone one runs out. There's one guy that stays in. He doesn't go with everybody else. So the jailers come back, see this guy still, and see there was this great escape. This guy's still in the cell, and they really give it to him. They start wailing on him, beating him, and he says, what did I do wrong? I did everything right. I stayed here. You should be angry at those guys, not at me. So the jailer says that, you know, I if the, the door's open, you're in a jail, the door's open, you'd expect them to leave. You stayed, you're making a statement that you don't care about the jail, that it's insignificant to you that it's it's almost like a slap in the face. It's like, um, you know, like someone hits you and you just, you know, you just shake it off like, yeah, that's not a big deal. It's like, <laughs> can't you do, is that the best you got? So if this guy is like sitting and the, the door is open and he doesn't leave, you're saying it's not that bad. But um, but anyway, but he says that the door is open for this person. He could leave and he's not leaving because he wants to stay. And that's also, again, that same problem is that he wants to stay. He doesn't understand that life is supposed to be out, out, out of the, the cell. Life is supposed to be out of someone else's control. Okay. Um, okay, then there's the sale of a daughter. Um, that a man could also sell his daughter as a bondswoman. With the, ex the expectation is that the purchaser would marry her when she becomes an adult or his son would marry her. The commentaries say that this was something that was done in desperation if a person couldn't afford to feed his family. So this way she would be insured she'd have a place to eat and, you know, a place to live and hopefully a person to marry where he, the father wouldn't be able to supply that. The Gemara says in general, though, the Gemara condition says in general that like it works for a father to marry off his daughter. When she's a minor, he says, never, it's, he's, the Gemara uses the expression, it's prohibited for a father to marry off his daughter when she's a minor. It's something that was done when people were desperate, but it's the Gemara says it's prohibited to do that until I she's, choose, so. yes. Okay, so uh, moving on. Um, it says in verse 10, if you shall take another in addition to her, Mary, he marries another woman in addition to this one. The Torah permits polygamy. It's prohibited by an enactment, by an early enactment by Rabbeinu Gershom, one of the great Ashkenazic sages. I believe it was accepted by most Sephardi communities as well. I think uh, among the Yemenites, they ha actually had polygamy much more recently because they never accepted this enactment. And it was practiced in their country. It wasn't not practiced, but... Um, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital relationship. And this is, and the um, Sforno adds in that this is telling us that a man is not allowed to marry another wife, a, you know, multiple, another wife, unless he's able, still able to supply his other wife with um, these things that are contractually obligated as part of his marriage. And those three things are her food, her clothing, and her intimate relationships. That's something that a, a man is, like we said, contractually obligated to provide for his wife. Okay, and if he does not perform these three things. Page 421 for her, he shall, he, she shall leave free of charge with that payment. Okay, now... Murder and manslaughter. So if someone strikes a man so that he dies, he shall surely be put to death. This is verse 12 on page 421. That a um, the punishment for murder is capital punishment. Absolutely. But for one who has not lain in ambush and God has caused it to come to his hand, meaning it was unintentional, but there was some level of negligence. So um, this might be the equivalent of manslaughter and American law, where it wasn't intended to kill, but there was a level of negligence, and he ended up killing. Um, I shall provide for you a place to which he shall flee. This is what we discussed earlier, mentioned earlier, that they would be exiled to specific cities. Now, if a man shall act intentionally against his fellow to murder him with guile, from my altar shall you take him to die. That means if someone killed intentionally, 
even if he's doing a big mitzvah, he's in the middle of, you know, bringing an offering, he's still taken out to be executed. And our sages say that this is a, um, the Torah is telling us that, I think Moshe Sternbach says that the Torah is telling us that um, don't think that if a person sins, he can make up for that sin by doing a mitzvah. Now, that's not the case, that mitzvahs are important, but in order to get rid of a sin, we need repentance, meaning you need to take care of the sin, not balance it out with other things, with mitzvahs. So even if he's busy doing, uh, you know, big mitzvahs, like bringing an offering, he would still be taken out to be punished. When it strikes his mother, father, and mother shall be put to death. This is if they cause a wound in their father and mother. And for this reason, the Paiskim say that so, uh, if someone's a doctor, they should avoid, try to avoid treating their father, their a parent, if they might cause a wound in the treatment. They, you know, they need to make an incision or something like that. But if it's necessary, they're allowed to. And not only allowed to, they're obligated to. Okay, uh, one who kidnaps a man, sells him, and who is found to have been in his power shall surely be put to death. Um, one who curses his father and mother shall surely be put to death. If men quarrel and one strikes, this verse 18, and quarrel, one strikes his fellow with a stone with his fist, he does not die but falls into bed. If he gets up and goes about outside under his own power, the one who struck is absolved, meaning even if he dies later, the one who struck him is absolved. He doesn't get a capital punishment. He has to pay for the damage that he caused. Um, only for his lost time shall he pay, and it shall provide for healing. So that's one. Um, these are two things that a person who um, damages another person, in Hebrew they call it chavalas, he wounds another person, he's liable for. that, um, And that is um, lost time, meaning the time that he missed from work, and um, he shall provide for his healing. You have to pay the doctor bills. And in fact, there are multiple things that a person they have to pay that we'll see later in the parsha. One of them is the damage that they caused. And that means that, let's say, uh, someone um, broke the other person's arm. And it never really heals proper, properly. And because of that, they're um, crippled in a way. And they can't work the way they used to. So he'd have to pay that. He'd have to pay for that, that reduction in the quality of life and the abilities of the person that he crippled him. And I'll just discuss in, um, when we get there what exactly that means, how they do that. There's this lost time from work. There's the doctor's bills. That's three, right? Um, then there's the, um, what am I missing? Oh, there's the pain. They have to pay for the pain that you cause, that a person causes. And they have to pay for the, um, and they have to pay for the shame that they cause. Okay, so now what, um, and maybe I'll just go there. I'll just skip a little bit just to, um, let's skip to um, verse 24 on page 423, because there we'll see a little more. Um, verse 24, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, a foot for a foot, a burn for a burn, a wound for a wound, a bruise for a bruise. This is page 423. Okay. Muslims take that literally. Maybe. I'm not familiar. Okay, I, I'll take you word for it. Like I said, I'm not familiar. But um, the Gemara, there's an extended Gemara in Baba Kama that um, it's like four pages or something that I'm um, bringing proofs as to that does not mean literally that if someone, let's say, knocks someone's eye out, blind someone, that we blind them themselves. They knock a tooth out, that we would knock their tooth out themselves. Right. And um, the, the Gemara says, this is telling us that you pay the value of the eye and the value of the tooth. Right, right. So what does that mean? How do you pay the value of an eye, the value of a tooth? That's interesting. So how do you appraise that? Like, how many, what, what's an eye worth? So the, the Gemara says that um, you... Uh, you think? Oh, yeah. For for that for this, what you do is you see how much the person would be would sell on the slave market with the eye, and how much and how much they would sell without it with af, after this damage, and you 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 would pay the difference. So that is, the person was not a slave. Is, it, they, you just use that as the baseline as how you appraise it, and just like a person would do with a car, let's say that there's two different ways to look at damage by a car. How much would it cost to replace the car? Or how much 
how much does will, will, would it cost to fix it? Or how much less is the car worth now? Right. Which might be two completely different amounts, but that's how it's the question is how much is it how much less is it worth now? And that that we evaluate how much would such a person be sold in the slave market before the damage and with this damage, and that's how we evaluate what the value of the damage was. Okay, and that would have to be paid from the damager to the damagee. Then um, we mentioned the time lost from work. There's the problem the Gemara says is that there's some overlap between the two. Because let's say the guy is a brain surgeon, yeah? And now he, um, this person um, broke his arm and crippled him. Now he can't do his brain surgery anymore. So obviously a brain surgeon would be very valuable on the slave market because the owner could have him do brain surgery and take all his salary. Right. So that would be very valuable. So um, that would so the difference in the price that he would fetch would be very big. So that, that would be the damage that's caused. Now you talk about the time lost from work. You can't evaluate how much he would be worth had the time that he all the money he would have made as a brain surgeon in that time, because that you're paying for already. You're already paying for the fact he can't do brain surgery anymore. So I say to say the time lost from work would be a what a completely unskilled laborer would get paid for that time that he can't work. And um, I think the, the way the Gemara puts it as, as like a vegetable, the guard, the security guard for a vegetable garden. That would just like, ch I guess, chase away animals that are coming to eat, you know, then chase away people coming to, to eat there. That that would be just like, yeah, basically, yeah. Okay, so that's that's those two. How do you evaluate pain? So here the Gemara says, the Gemara posits perhaps it would be how much a person would um, would be willing to be paid to experience that pain. And then the Gemara said, what kind of crazy person would take even, let's say, the pain of you know losing an arm? Like what kind of crazy person would take money for that? And that would be, I guess, a, a, a fortune. Would someone take a billion dollars to have that pain of losing an arm? Maybe. I doubt. So the Gemara says that it's, the answer is actually the opposite. It's how much a person would be willing to pay. Let's say there were, a person was going to lose their arm. They needed the arm amputated. How much would they willing to be willing to pay for anesthesia to not experience that pain? Probably, it would probably be quite a bit, but it would be a different number. And there would probably be a high end that a person would say, I can't afford that. I wouldn't pay. There's a high end that a person wouldn't pay for the medicine that would dis well, get rid of the pain. Back in December, I had to have yeah. an implant. I'd have a... Okay. Wow, he said, you're going to... Yeah. Some people choose not to return. So what's the difference? I think. 100 bucks. Yeah. Whatever. Perfect. Yeah. Was he serious that people, some people don't pay? He said something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, and that's... It's not enough. To right, it's not enough to get rid of the pain. And that might be they give you a stick to bite on. To... <laughs> right, but... Right. Right, and that's the answer. And that's the answer the Gemara gives for how we evaluate, how we value pain is how much a person would be willing to pay for medicine that would that would take away the pain okay and that's pain and and then there's the shame the doctor's bills are should be straightforward and um shame the gemara says that an r did that you would need real expert judges to be able to value shame but what would the shame um i i mean let's say someone gets shame wouldn't actually necessarily come with a wound but let's say someone gets hit in the face in public. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's, you know, that's that's embarrassing. Right. Or, or even maybe the shame, like if someone's, um, if someone is um, disfigured. Right. Yeah, there's, there's, there's embarrassment involved, there's shame involved. And, uh, you know, people, I, you know, this is terrible. I read a story recently that there was a girl who was like filmed being beaten in the hallway. Right. And in this in school and she and that video went out in social media and she, she killed herself. Yeah. Right. And that's 
shame from nothing was wrong with it. Being bullied yeah. and she got beat up in school. And it wasn't the first time this has happened at school. I, I saw that. Yeah. She, I did, uh, it was videoed. Like he said, it was put out there. And she killed herself. Yeah. Well, it's, that's ridiculous. Yes. If someone bullied me, I would. <laughs> Right. Well, I yeah. Kill well, <laughs> she, obviously, she wasn't holding by that, and it, it's something that people feel very embarrassed. It's not something that people should feel embarrassed about, perhaps, but it's something that people that's deeply affecting, and it's it devalues a person when they, you know, like that. People, other people are laughing at their pain. It's something that completely could destroy a person. And, yeah, and that girl. That girl yeah. that killed herself several months yeah. earlier, she saved the drowning girl. Oh, wow. She jumped in the pool and saved the girl. From wow. Her. Yeah, it's so sad. So anyway, the Torah, the Torah says that we pay that if someone shames in the person, they would have to pay that. They would have to pay for that shame. And like I said, the Gemara says that you, that you need expert judges to the point that it says outside Eretz Yisrael, where we don't have smicha, that it used to be it used to be that um, that in order to, for someone to be part of a court, they would need to have smicha. They would need to have a um, a rabbi that would actually lean their hands on their head with a who will him themselves ha ha had smicha going back to Moshe Rabbeinu, going back from it's Moshe who received the Torah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And how much is a life worth? So that's what they're exactly right. And what's interesting is that there's very few cases in the Torah right. where we actually talk about. This is about damage, mm -hmm. but it's very it's not very often we talk about how much a life is worth because usually a murderer would be subject to capital punishment, right. and there's no and once they're getting capital punishment, we don't talk about money. Right, we're, but, we're yeah. all talking about money. An arm gets taken off. Right, exactly. Where someone is well, and and even if it's the once again the nezek, the damage is if it's permanent damage that they're right. they're crippled or in some way. The shame, there doesn't have to even be permanent damage. Yeah. Where am I? Um, does it talk about it here? Yeah. Um, and um, it, later, it talks about, is that in this way? It talks about a woman, a girl who was seduced, but, um, and there by a girl that was seduced. This is um, at a, a mine, not necessarily a minor, but a young age. So below the age of let's say twelve and a half or so, so um, so there the Rambam says that it, that's considered assault to a certain point, and there also that the um, the the one who seduced her would have to pay for the pagam, which the, the equivalent of the damage, which would be like she her reputation is damaged, but also the shame, and he would have to pay that. And if she, if she was if she was raped, so in that case, and they would have to pay um, all five. He would have to pay for um, the damage. He would have to pay for the um, the pain, and it would be treated like any other assault where he would have to pay all of these things. And plus, there's a kinas. Plus, there's a fine that he has to pay on top of that. Okay. Um, so let's continue. Um, it talks about if an animal causes death. Well, I, let's go to. Damage. OK, um, um, so in verse 33. Um, if a man shall uncover a pit or if a man shall dig a pit and not cover it and an ox or donkey fall into it, the owner of the pit shall make restitution, shall return money to his owner and the carcass shall be his. So this is a pit, but this is, our sages say, any obstacle a person makes in a public domain. This would be if a person digs a pit in the public domain, but also if a person, let's say, would leave their, you know, their bike on a public sidewalk and someone would be hurt by it. And um, any obstacle or, you know, any obstacle a person puts in the public domain. And um, then in verse 35, if a one man's ox shall strike his fellow's ox, which dies, 
They shall sell the living ox and divide its money and the carcass too they shall divide. But if it became known, this is verse 35 on page 425 and verse 36. But if it became known that it was an ox that had gored habitually from yesterday and before yesterday, but its owner did not guard it, he shall surely pay an ox in place of the ox and the carcass shall be his. So there are two categories. So when it, when it comes to an animal, damaging an animal intentionally. So this is where it um, attacks another animal. So it's, let's say, an ox that gores another animal. You have a dog that bites another animal. You know, that damages intentionally. So um, in that case, the assuming that it's a, the type of animal that's not expected to do this. So if it hasn't done it three times, if it's not considered a, um, a what are they called? A habitual damager. So in that case, the owner would only pay half for half of the damage and only up to the point of the value of the animal that did the goring. And that's what it means when it says, they shall sell the living ox and divide its money. Meaning they sell the living ox and use that to pay for half the value of what it damaged. But if it's a, but if it's a habitual damage, or meaning this is an ox that's been, that, that's gored or other things three times already and the owner has been warned. So then, um, then he has to pay the full value of whatever damage it did. So that's, um, okay. So now in verse 37, if a man shall steal an ox or a sheep or a goat and slaughter it or sell it, he shall pay five cattle in place of the ox, four sheep in place of the sheep. Usually a thief would pay double. He pays the value of what he stole plus a surcharge that he has to pay double. But um, but if he steals livestock and either slaughters it or sells it, so if it's a cattle, he would pay four, t I'm sorry, he'd pay, pay five times the value. If it's a sheep, he'd pay four times the value. Why the difference? So our sages say that when someone steals a sheep, they have to carry it away. It doesn't like follow him. But an ox, you don't carry it away, you lead it. So the just the shame of having to carry this thing over his, the sheep over his shoulder in public, that um that shame exempts him a little bit from um pay, payment. Okay. So now, verse um, um, page four twenty seven, chapter twenty two. This is a foundational idea in um, damages, and that is, if a thief is discovered while tunneling in a home invasion, he tunneled into someone's house, and he is struck and died and dies. There is no blood guilt on his account. There's an assumption. The Torah says that there's an assumption that a home invader is willing to kill. And um, if someone kills him in the act, it's considered self-defense. And they, um, there's no blood guilt on his account. But if the sun shone upon him, there is blood, blood guilt on his account. What does that mean? If it's clear that he was not going to hurt the home, homeowner, in that case, the home, homeowner would be considered a murderer for having killed him. What's that case? So Rashi says, that's a case, let's say, where it's apparent stealing from his child. And um, so in that case, there's an assumption that even though he's stealing, but there's enough love between them that he wouldn't kill him if it if he's confronted. Parents stealing child, that's like an insider job. Or maybe or he's maybe he knows his way around, but he's breaking yeah. in. A parent's breaking into his child's house to steal from him. Child, well, parents. child may not meaning a minor, child meaning his son or daughter. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, where are we? Um, okay, another category of damage. Back to damage. Um, um, and verse four, if a man permits livestock, livestock to devour a field or vineyard, whether he sets loose his livestock or graze it in another field. Setting loose, our sages interpret to mean that it was trampling someone else's um, stuff. Like, let's say... It, you have their cow is walking through a vegetable garden, so it could damage by eating the stuff, or it could damage by trampling the stuff. In either case, um, from the best of his field, the best of his vineyard, he pays. He has to pay for that damage. And but this is only, as it says, in another's field, only in their domain. But if it's in a public place, in a public street, then he's not liable. So let's say if someone leaves a pile of hay at the street corner, and someone's leading their um, cow or you know down the street and it eats from that hay so their owner would not be liable it's only if it's in someone else's property 
Okay, in verse 5, if a fire shall go forth, find thorns and stacks of grain, a standing crop or in a field is consumed, the one who kindled the fire shall make restitution. And our sages say, what's this adding? We've seen that a person is liable for damage they themselves caused. We see that they're liable for damage that their property caused. We see that they're liable even if it's not their property, but they made a damager, like they dug a pit in a public domain. Now we're talking about that a person lights a fire so there's a combination of forces that are involved in the damage. The person lit the fire here. It damages by spreading, going somewhere else, and it's driven by the wind. The fire spreads where the wind blows it. So one might say, think that since there's an outside force involved, they're less liable. So the Torah is saying they're liable for that as well. Okay, um, now next we have the laws of Shomrim of um, custodians, and I'll just begin reading, and then I'll just discuss all of them quickly. Now I see what that means. Shomim, shomer. Yes, shomrim is the plural for shomer, exactly. And that's a custodian. So if a man shall give money or vessels to his fellow to safeguard, verse 6, and it is stolen from the house of the man, if the thief is found, he shall pay double. This is the double that we talked about. If the thief is not found, then the householder shall approach the court that he had not laid his hand upon his fellow's property for every liable, every item of liability, whether an ox, donkey, sheep, or garment regarding any lost item about which he says, this is it to the court, shall come both their claims. Whomever the court finds guilty shall pay double to his fellow if it was stolen. Okay, so this first case is the case, our sages say, of a free custodian, meaning that someone who accepted to watch someone else's stuff for free. So let's say, uh, let's say, you know, a friend is going out of town and they ask you, can you please uh, watch my cat? And they're not paying you for it. So that's a free custodian. So if anything happens to that cat, the one who's watching it is exempt. Unless they are, unless they're poche, unless they're um, completely, what's the word? Um, they, negligent. They, yeah, they're completely negligent if they just leave the door open and uh, don't do anything to watch it, and it gets away, and gets run over by a car, then they're liable because of negligence. But otherwise, if it's stolen, if it's lost, with and they did, they weren't negligent, so in that case, they're not liable. What? I thought you... I, I, I okay, got you got it? it? Yeah. Okay, that's well, a free you, custodian. Well, the, yeah. What about a paid custodian? Let's say someone, uh, you're going out of town, you want someone to watch your horse, so you pay them. To watch their horse. If you're being, if someone's being paid, they're accepting more liability. And in that case, the Torah says that if it gets stolen or lost, they have to pay. Because just by being, just by accepting payment, you're accepting more liability. But if an accident happens, if there's completely, if an accident dies on its own, or something that that has no liability involved, then the watchman is exempt. And a renter also has the same responsibility as a paid watchman. It's similar because a renter is um, getting benefit and taking also watching someone else's thing. Very expensive bird. Yeah. Oh no, that's an interesting case. Right, right. That's an interesting case because there are two issues involved there. They, because there's the watching part and there's your property damaging part. <laughs> well, 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 you have to know because um, with a dog eating meat, a dog is a carnivore. So eating meat isn't just a, you know, damaging intentionally. It's eating the same as we talked about, like if you lead an animal through someone's field and it eats the stuff. So the dog eating a bird might be that the same level. It's not attacking, it's eating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, the, okay, and there's one more category of custodian, and that is a borrower. That if someone borrows a, um, let's say, a horse, then they're liable for anything that happens to it, unless it's a, uh, I think Tyson says, unless it's completely, completely, completely like rend, like act of God, as they say, like a, if lightning came out of a clear, clear sky and struck the horse, then they're exempt. And also there's another exemption, and that is if it died through normal use. Then they, meaning you borrowed it to use it, you were, you were given permission to use it, and it died through normal use, so then one would be exempt. So, and this would be true about not just a horse, it would be true of modern cases like a car. That if someone rented a car 
and it got stolen, they would be liable to pay under halacha because a renter is liable for um, something being stolen. But if someone, um, if someone asked someone else, can you watch my car and didn't pay them, if it got stolen, they're exempt because a, um, a, an unpaid custodian is not liable for something having been stolen. And a borrower, like we said, is liable for anything except if it dies through normal use. So if someone was driving the car normally and just the engine just went, so then they would not be liable because that would be considered dying through normal use. Okay, and now we have um, the borrower and then a seduction I mentioned before, if a man shall, on page verse 15, shall seduce a virgin who is not betrothed in lie with her, shall provide her with a marriage contract as a wife. Then we have a mitzvah to, um, in verse 20 on page 431, oh, and there's, um, that's only, that, sorry, I should clarify um, the, about the seduction, that he's obligated to marry her only if she wants to be married to him. If, mm -hmm. if she doesn't, he, and then he doesn't have to, then he is not allowed to, obviously. Yeah, okay. And um, he'd also have to pay a fine. And like I mentioned, he'd also have to pay the damage and the, which is the nazik, the begam, the blemish that it's caused with her reputation. And the, okay. Um, what else? Um, skipping to me, we have an obligation to be sensitive to people like a widow, an orphan, a convert who might not have a the support system that others have, and they have a special relationship with Hashem. The bottom of page 431, verse 24, when you lend money to my people, I say to say this when means it's a mitzvah, thou shalt lend money to my people. It's a mitzvah to lend money to the needy. The poor person with you, do not act towards him as a creditor. Don't um, be overly dominant over him. Um, in verse 25 on page 433, if you take your fellow's garment as security until sunset, you shall return it to him. For it is alone his clothing. If you take his blanket, you have to bring it back to him for him to use at night because that's his blanket that he has. You can take his mattress as a security for the loan, but you have to return it at night for him to use it. So what's the use of taking it as a security? One of them is that if he dies, so if a borrower dies, usually the law is that the inheritors don't have to pay back their, their father's loans, except from the real property of the state. Real property means land, but not from the movable property, not like from the... So, um, but if you have it as a security, even if though you're returning it at night, if he were to die, then you would be able to collect from that. Um, that's one answer that's given. Okay. Um, am I? Oh, and it says, uh, again, in the end of verse 24, do not lay interest upon him. This is the mitzvah of not taking interest from another Jew. That means not taking, not lending and taking back more than what was borrowed. Um, then we have an, a mitzvah to be have integrity in the justice system, to be fair with justice, meaning not to favor the rich over the poor, and not to favor the poor over the rich, which is something that someone might have a streak of righteousness and think that, um, well, this guy should, you know, this guy's rich, this guy's poor. The rich guy should be supporting the poor guy anyway. So I'll just say that he's liable, and that way he'll be really be doing what he should be doing anyway. That when somebody is adjudicating a case, they have to go follow the law, not what they feel should be happening. Okay, then we have um, the mitzvah of Shemitah. Of, um, that's the sabbatical year. And... Um, that means six years you shall, in verse, verse 10 on page 435, six years you shall sow your land, gather the produce in the seventh, you have to leave it untended. And um, in verse 12, we have the mitzvah of Shabbos. Six days you shall accomplish your activities, and the seventh day you shall desist. And in, on page 437, verse 14, we have the three pilgrimage festivals. That's Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot. And notice that when, when it mentions Sukkot, this is verse... Um, 16, it says, in the festival of the harvest for the first fruits of your labor that you sow in the field, that is Shavuos, and then and the festival of the ingathering at the close of the year. That's Sukkot. But it doesn't call it Sukkot. It calls, calls it the festival of the ingathering. So the Meshach Hachman says the reason for that is, is that the, according to Vilna Gon, we what are we celebrating with Sukkot? We're celebrating the clouds of glory that has surrounded us in the desert, but specifically according to the Vilna Gon, we're celebrating the return of the clouds of glory after they had departed from us when we sinned with the golden calf. So we repented and um, then we received the second tablets. 
And that was on Yom Kippur. And then um, we were commanded to build the Mishkan, the tabernacle. And when we began building the tabernacle, which was a symbolism that Hashem's presence will rest among us, the clouds of glory came back. And that was, after Yom Kippur, that was on Sukkot. So that hadn't happened yet because we're still dealing with the first title, the first, before they had sinned. So it's not called Sukkot yet. It's called this the celebration of the ingathering of the produce that they harvested in Shavuos and it was out in the field drying and being processed until we actually brought it into our houses on Sukkot. Okay, and then we have the promise about going, Hashem protecting us going into the land of Israel and um, how we should have not follow the idolatry of the residents of the land. And then it talks about everything that happened when we received the Torah. And Moshe going up for 40 days and 40 nights after the Ten Commandments, we heard the Ten Commandments, to be taught the Torah by Hashem. And like it was mentioned, this week is Parsha Shkalim. That means that there's a second Torah that's brought out where we read from Parsha's Kisisa. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but that is, we read from the beginning of Kisisa, which is on page... I'll get there. On page 485, which talks about giving a half shekel for the census of the children of Israel. And that's because now around current time is when they would begin collecting the half shekels that they would bring for the um, communal offerings. And um, and the Haftorah is also the Haftorah for, um, for Parsha Shkalim, that special Haftorah on page um, 1213, 1213. And it discusses the inauguration, the coronation of Yoash, Yeh Yehoash, who was a fascinating person. He was a um, son, I think, or a grandson of um, Queen Atalia, who was a queen of Yehuda. She, she married the king of Yehuda, but she was the daughter of um, Ahav and Jezebel, who were not nice. not nice. They were Israelite king and queen. They were from the 10 tribes, the Israelite kingdom, but she married into the kingdom of Yehuda. And um, when her husband died, so... Um, she killed everyone in the family so she could rule. She didn't want her to lose the rulership. So she killed all the descendants of, of the king, all the descendants of King David, so she would be the sole ruler. And except she missed one, that was this boy, Yoash, who was hidden by the Kohen Gadol in the Holy of Holies. And he lived there for years. And... Um, and then when he was seven years old, he was brought out and the people accepted him as king and they executed Atalia. Okay, Shkoyesh. Shkoyesh, have a great job.